All right, uh, welcome to the webinar. Today we are going to talk about safety planning for LGBTQIA survivors. It's a, a much requested topic and I'm glad we will be able to cover it today. All right, so let's look at a couple of our objectives here. So we are going to explore safety planning best practices for LGBTQIA survivors. Um, we are also going to navigate uh, trauma-informed advocacy techniques for safety planning um, for LGBTQIA folks. Um, so sometimes um, we may not understand that trauma-informed advocacy can look a little bit different for different folks that we serve um, and in different scenarios. Um, you know, we've heard some of the basic kind of go-to responses and stuff like that, but we're going to explore those in a little bit more detail. Um, and then lastly, uh, we are going to review the sections of a safety plan, and we are going to talk about how we can best advocate and best support um, LGBTQ survivors um, when we are doing the safety planning. All right, so we're going to get right into it. So I want to know who is here. I want to know who I'm talking to, who's listening to me. Um, a poll should pop up on your screen here in a second. There you go. Um, so just select one of those options that best fits who you are. We have about 75 folks who have voted yet. We'll give just another uh, couple seconds. There we go. All right. Let's see. There we go. And it should pop up on your screen. So it looks like 50% um, of y'all are from community based nonprofit. Um, victim advocate organizations, nice. We got 25% uh, government um, organization folks, and we got 25% social service organization folks, so nice. We got a nice little, little spread of folks um, that are attending today, and hopefully we'll have a, a bunch more, or a couple more folks um, show up momentarily. And as always, um, if you would like to answer or ask a question, you can. You can do so by either raising your hand or um, asking a question in the, the question box that should appear on the, the right side of your screen. And I'll be able to um, look at those throughout the webinar. All right, so um, let's begin here. Um, who is the Utah Domestic Violence Coalition? What is the Utah Domestic Violence Coalition? Um, so we are the nationally recognized um, domestic violence coalition for the state of Utah. So what we do is we work with organizations throughout the state, um, including government organizations, nonprofit organizations, um, other social service organizations, um, even the, the the community, you know, folks that uh, live in live in the state of Utah. Um, on how to effectively stop and how to lower those rates of domestic um, and intimate partner violence. Um, we work with an, a number of different uh, organizations in doing so. Um, currently, there are 15 domestic violence service providers in the state of Utah, and we do support them through a number of things like training and webinars and stuff like that. Um, yeah, we're pretty, we do a lot of stuff here. Um, the majority of what we do is uh, is these trainings. Um, so what you've seen about the Utah Domestic Violence Coalition is probably training offerings and billboards um, on the freeway. All right, so the basic question, what we're here for today, what is safety planning? So I'm gonna ask y'all, what is safety planning to you? What do you think is safety planning? Maybe in your experience, what has safety planning been? Um, should poll should pop up on your screen here in a sec. There we go. All right, so 
What is safety planning? Is it a collaboration with safety as a goal? Is it risk reduction? Is it simply having a conversation with folks? Um, is it information sharing? Um, or could it be prepara preparation for the future? What do y'all think safety planning is? Or in your experience, what has um, safety planning been for you? We got about half of the folks voting so far. See if we can get a couple more folks to chime in. Give you a couple more seconds for that. We got the majority of folks. All right. Okay. So let's see what y'all said. So a collaboration, the majority of you said, um, so 83% said a collaboration with safety as the goal. And then 17% said risk, risk reduction. So the majority of you said a collaboration with safety as a goal. Um, and that's, I, I think that's an excellent definition for a safety planning, uh, for a safety plan. Um, Cause what we are doing as service providers, what we are doing as um, advocates um, is sitting with someone going through their experience we're collaborating with them and we're finding ways to help keep them self to help keep them safe excuse me um, it also includes an element of risk reduction right um, and of course it is a conversation hopefully hopefully you're having a conversation um, with that survivor um, part of that trauma-informed advocacy that 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 trauma-informed care is that it's survivor centered and that the survivor has a voice. The survivor has a say in what is happening to them and what is happening with them. Um, and it's also about information sharing. Um, think about when, you know, we do sit down and do a safety plan that oftentimes we're thinking of, of ways, maybe even unique ways or creative ways on how we can increase our safety, right? And sometimes, um, we do um, you know, talk about new resources or um, new devices and so on that can help us with that. Um, and then lastly, preparation for the future. Absolutely. Um, a big part of safety planning is prepping for the future, is not only is that going to help alleviate some of those feelings of anxiety, some of the feelings of dread, um, you know, fear, maybe terror, but it also helps us plan and prepare. So we know, hey, this is a plan, this is what we can do in case something like da 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 happens. So excellent. There we go. All right, let's move on. So this is the definition that the National Domestic Violence Hotline has on their website. Um, so safety planning is an important aspect of how advocates help callers uh, protect themselves emotionally and physically in an abusive relationship. A safety plan is a personalized, practical plan that can help you avoid dangerous situations and know the best way to react when you are in danger. Um, so that seems like a pretty, a pretty good, uh, you know, basic definition of a safety planning, of a safety plan. Um, you know, we're including the the emotional and the physical aspects of the safety plan. Um, you know, it's not a uh, contrary to you know popular you know, belief, you know, historically is that we've seen domestic violence as being a physical issue. And we know that emotions and that emotional control and coercion is very much a part of that. And that can make it, that can be a very, a huge barrier, making it very difficult for someone to be able to, um, you know, leave or have, a, you know, have a healthy life. So this question here at the bottom, how is that different from risk reduction? So that kind of sounds a little bit like risk reduction, right? Um, you've seen risk reduction. Generally, um, we see, you know, don't go out at night after, you know, midnight or don't leave your purse on your seat um, when you go to the park. Um, you know, things like this that, you know, folks are like, OK, here's what we can do to kind of lower our risk um, of certain things. However, sometimes risk reduction can be um, 
victim blaming. It can seem victim blaming as well. And so that's where this trauma informed piece comes comes into play. Um, when we use some elements of risk reduction, when we use elements of planning, and we use that trauma informed that survivor focused and that survivors input on how to best increase their safety and decrease their danger. Um, that's when we have a safety plan and that's when it becomes very, very beneficial for that person. So now let's talk about some major, here's kind of an overview of like the major barriers um, for LGBTQIA folks. So LGBTQIA defined as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, questioning, intersex, intergender, asexual, agender, um, two-spirit, pansexual, demisexual. Um, there's, there's a there's a bunch of identities included in this. Um, and we need to remember the reason why we have so many letters in that LGBTQIA plus um, acronym is because this includes everyone who is not heterosexual and everyone who is not cisgender. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna see increased barriers. We're gonna see um, folks having a more difficult time accessing basic services um, because they are seen as the other, because they are, they are not seen as that norm or that, that quote unquote traditional identity. So some of the, 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 the barriers that are faced by LGBTQIA folks um, would include homophobia, right? So homophobia can look like um, microaggressions. So saying things like, oh, I'm okay with gay people as long as they don't hit on me, right? So we're kind of assuming that all you know gay folks are are hitting on everyone and are attracted to all these people and we're also assuming that um one of the main goals and one of the main things that you know gay people do is is seek out people sexually or, or hit on people or maybe even harass people and that's that's greatly untrue and then we also see a side of homophobia like hate crimes um bias-based crimes so um you know we see you've heard it as you know gay bashing um even homophobic slurs being said to people um, in schools, on the street, stuff like that. Um, transphobia. Um, transphobia, we're seeing an increase in transphobia. Um, and even with our domestic violence service provider, providers, um, we, have, we have an increase of victimization against trans folks. We're seeing more hate crimes. Um, we're seeing more harassment, especially in bathrooms. Um, and additionally, we're also seeing laws um, that are that are transphobic, that are stopping transgender people from living their every everyday lives and are taking away rights, even uh, basic human rights from folks. We have heteronormativity, the idea that everyone is heterosexual and those who are not heterosexual are different or um, invalid. So we see this in our marketing. We see this on TV. Um, think about the last time you saw a, like an engagement ring ad, right? When's the last time you saw a queer couple, right? When's the last time you saw um, a heterosexual couple of color, right? So we're seeing a lot of these, these things um, inter interwoven with each other. And then we see cis normativity. So this is the idea that everyone is cis, um, cisgender. So their gender identity, so their sense of maleness, femaleness, multiple genders or no gender is congruent with or quote unquote matches their sex assigned at birth. Uh, so statistically speaking, the majority of folks would identify as cisgender, um, you know, generally someone who isn't, you know, transgender. Um, However, this idea of cisnormativity suggests that everyone is cisgender and that being transgender is the other, is, is, is not normal, is devalued. And so we see that with portrayals of transgender folks on TV. Um, think about, for example, like Orange is the New Black. Um, it's, a, it's a cisnormative representation of a transgender person. So we're seeing that this transgender person is in jail because of their transgender identity, because they committed certain crimes to, um, you know, transition and stuff like that. Um, think about when trans folks are shown on, um, on TV, on media, and so on. Notice, 
notice how they're they're being portrayed as notice is it a negative portrayal is there something inherently wrong with them and usually um, associated with their gender identity or are they super happy are they are they so you know perfect and this that and the other so notice how we see this this very like binary these um these uh these dichotomous views of transgender folks the good and the bad right so another barrier coming out right the idea that someone even has to come out as as lesbian or gay um, bisexual um, as transgender that this identity is so different than the norm that we have to we have to come out we have to show people we have to tell people about our identity because it's so different right and also when we you know folks do come out there's you know sometimes increases of hate crimes um we could see we see folks losing their housing losing their jobs and stuff like this right um and that kind of leads us to the next one is hate crimes so um unfortunately we have um in the past uh you know year and a half have seen uh, an increase in hate crimes and victimization against LGBTQIA folks. Um, lack of legal protections. We kind of talked about that with uh, homophobia and transphobia. Um, not only are we legalizing um, transphobic hate and homophobic hate, um, but we are also stripping away protections from marginalized identities that desperately need this legal protection because without that legal protection, they're seemingly helpless, right? Who's there to protect them? Who's there to help them? Um, so lack of support. So this could be through community, this could be, um, you know, family support system, et cetera, et cetera. Um, think, about, think about how many LGBTQIA service providers there are out there. Think about, um you might think of like things like the pride center you know stuff like that yeah um that's in salt lake what happens to folks who are in richfield what happens to folks who are in moab right um where where can folks go to get services where can folks go to find this support right and that can be difficult um think about even within your own organizations how many um lgbtqia folks even work there right um that are out that you know it's known within that organization how many how many folks do you see on a daily basis that identify as lgbtqia um, where's that where's the visibility there so now what we're going to do is we're going to break down sections of a safety plan so one of the things i want you to remember about a safety plan is that you literally safety plan every day of your life. You may not be go, you know, go through a 10 page packet on every, you know, type of, of safety planning, but think about when you send your kids to school, right? What do you say? say? Oh, you know, if you're, you know, if they're walking, like, you know, just make sure that you look both ways, you know, when you cross the street, don't talk to strangers, you know, go into class and, you know, text me or whatever, right? Um, what about when our partner is going to work and, you know, we, you know, wish them, hey, I have, hope you have a good day at work. Careful, traffic out there is a little bit, you know, rough. Like all these different ways that we very casually safety plan. So when we talk about a domestic violence um, safety plan, what we're talking about is it could be a conversation, right? But generally what we're talking about is a, a, a packet of information, if you will, um, that a survivor and an advocate go over together. They talk about plans, strategies for increasing safety, and that information is given and shared with, the, with that survivor. So generally the first section of a safety plan is safety during a violent incident and so what this is geared towards is increasing safety when there is a violent interaction violent incident with that partner um, with abusive behavior right and it looks like some of my my dot points here are the number 10 which is a little interesting so <laughs> that didn't translate very well okay so there's three major parts of this that we need to know a, are any of the neighbors 
affirming? Do the neighbors even know um, that the that abuse is happening with the home? Um, is it safe to talk to neighbors, right? Because what happens during a violent incident, um, oftentimes the neighbors hear it, right? Think about um, the times, you know, the places that you've lived throughout your life. How many times have you heard the neighbors fighting, right? How many times have you heard the neighbors kids crying or or whatnot, right? So, so think about being in a domestic violence situation and your neighbors hearing that. They may be hearing it often. They may have, you know, be hearing it for years. Um, do your neighbors actually know what's happening? And is it safe to talk to those neighbors and get those neighbor support? For example, um, you know, maybe coming up with a code word. Right, so that's often used um, in safety planning is giving neighbors, friends, and stuff like that a code word that if that survivor texts, calls, or says that code word, that those people know, hey, something's happening, and I need to call the police, or something's happening, and I need to call their parents or or someone that the survivor and those neighbors and those support system have agreed upon, right? Um, we do need to remember that calling the police may not always be the best answer, um, especially for marginalized identities um, and identities and groups that have historically had um, issues um, with the police and have um, seen, you know, like police violence and stuff like that. Um, so make sure that this is a conversation that the survivor um, is very much involved in. Um, Second one, seeking support from law enforcement. We kind of talked about that. Um, so does the survivor feel safe with the police, right? Um, so if the survivor is a transgender person, um, unfortunately we do see, uh, we have seen an increase, or excuse me, we have seen elevated rates of um, police violence, um, um, inappropriate conduct, stuff like that related to um, trans folks and you know folks of color. Um, Additionally, are the police culturally competent, right? So in Utah, we've had a, the privilege to be able to work with many of our police agencies and offer training um, and do cross training um, with many of the law enforcement um, uh, groups uh, within Utah, which has been awesome, right? Um, so many of our um, police officers within Utah have received training specifically for LGBTQ folks from the coalition. They have received, um, you know, training for the lethality assessment protocol. Um, however, does that survivor feel like their law enforcement is culturally competent? What have, what experiences has that survi survivor had um, with their local law enforcement, right? So make sure that we're having those conversations with that survivor because law enforcement may not be the most appropriate um, for them and they may not feel the safest with law enforcement. And then the, the third, um, you know, being outed, that idea, um, that fear even of being outed, um, that maybe your neighbors don't know, right? Um, not only may your neighbors not know, but they may not know that this is a partner. They may think that this is a roommate or that maybe it's a roommate and their partner fighting. So they maybe, they don't even know the details, right? Is it safe to talk? Um, to your neighbors. You know, are there other LGBTQIA folks within that neighborhood that may be uh, beneficial to reaching out to? All right, so now let's go to safety when preparing to leave. So remember if any of you attended some of the other webinars, specifically the DV 101, um, you know, we learned that the time right before a survivor leaves and the time right after a survivor leaves are the most dangerous time for that survivor. Um, we see 75% of folks who were murdered by their partner um, was during this time. So think about you know, when a survivor is leaving that situation, that when they leave, that power and control that that, that partner with abusive behavior has is immediately cut off, right? And so absolutely we see um, escalations in, in violence and physical violence and stuff like that. So it's really important that, you know, if a survivor is, um, you know, planning to leave, preparing to leave, that they keep um, a couple things in mind. First off, that when we're, we're leaving, um, we do it when the 
partner, that person with abusive behavior is not at the shared living space. So maybe when they're at home or when they're at the gym, something like that, right? And to prepare for that, it's you know best practice to get an emergency bag or have some, some things collected, right? So for example, when working with um, like transgender folks, making sure that we have gender change documents. Um, this could be actual um, legal gender change from a court. It could be notes from the doctor. Um, it could be notes from like driver license division, things like that. Um, think about if we have a transgender person who has maybe gone through the legal gender change um, process been granted the legal gender change however they have not updated their like driver's license birth certificate and stuff like that um, then that's kind of an issue so we have them you know trying to leave trying to maybe reestablish themselves without identification that matches their legal identification their their legal gender um, so it's really important to have those documents and if, if anything, have copies of those documents, right? Um, additionally, marriage and divorce papers. And then you may think of, well, why marriage and divorce papers? Like, you know, this, why do I need these? Um, however, we do unfortunately see cases where um, folks are denied access to um, like children in like hospitals, um, or denied certain benefits um, when they go in or um, to, to get services, excuse me, go in to get services um, or other things. Um, and having that, that marriage or divorce papers, um, unfortunately, might be necessary to um, get the process um, to go quickly. Um, unfortunately, um, LGBTQIA folks um, do need, you know, to show more proof or have excessive amounts of proof to be legitimized in many spaces um, within our culture. Um, last thing is updated ID documents. If they, if they do have those, um, definitely have copies, um, stuff like that um, in that to-go bag. Okay. Um, so remember that when folks are leaving a situation, um, when they're preparing to leave, that resources may be limited. Right, so they may not be able to talk um, with certain folks. They may not be able to seek support. They may not be able to share this with anyone. This literally may be something that them and their advocate have planned and are setting up. Right, so it's super important. Um, additionally, that they have hormone or transition related items. So, if um, someone who is transgender, if they are taking hormone replacement therapy. Um, and they stop taking hormones abruptly, there could be some, you know, pretty, pretty drastic physical and emotional um, changes um, with that. So we want to make sure that they have access to their medication. Um, they have access to their transition related items. This could be binders um, for trans men or trans masculine folks. Um, this could be packers. Um, this could be any um, synthetics, uh, things like that, um, chest plates, things like that. Um, and sometimes these can be large and kind of bulky, right? And so let's make sure that we're having those conversations with um, that survivor and finding out what works best for them and how we can help meet their needs um, in, an, in an effective way. And of course, house paperwork, kind of similar to the divorce and marriage papers, is that um, they may have to have, you know, copies of their house paperwork in order to um, get certain protections or to allow um, for them to do a, a divorce. Okay, so safety in their residence. So notice that the first section we talked about safety during a violent incident, right? So now we're talking about safety just in the residence. So the survivor and the person with abusive behavior are just at home or maybe one's at work, right? So how do we increase that safety? So similar to the things that we talked about on the, the other sections, is there a support system in place? Do the neighbors know about the abuse? Um, does family know about the abuse? Um, 
does family even know that there's a relationship, right? So some of the things that you may have heard about safety, like specifically in their residence um, or during a violent incident, is that we kind of want to avoid certain places in the home, right? So for example, the kitchen. Um, if there's a violent incident or maybe a partner is coming home and we know that they're upset, that what can we do? We can hide knives, things like that in the kitchen, or we can stay out of the kitchen, um, similar to the bathroom, um, stay out of the bathroom, uh, generally bathroom windows and um, even entrances, entrances and exits in a bathroom are limited. Um, so staying out of um, small areas without multiple um, ex exits would be beneficial. Um, and also, you know, talk with your survivor. I know that when I um, do safety planning with folks, we go over kind of like an outline um, of their home. So we draw out, okay, so here's the kitchen, here's the bathroom, here's the, the bedroom, here's the garage, and so on, right? And then we kind of go over, okay, so in this situation, you're in the, the bathroom, what's a way you can escape? Or what's a way you can protect yourself, right? Um, so that has been really beneficial for folks to kind of, oh, to think about, oh, that does make sense. That if something does happen or, you know, generally, um, my partner um, maybe get angry or um, maybe some abuse generally happens in the, the bedroom or in the front room that we know kind of how to navigate those situations, right? Um, and then lastly, is it, is it safe to even identify as LGBTQIA in that neighborhood, right? Um, think about hate crimes, think about um, harassment, things like this. Um, is that present in that neighborhood? Um, have there been increased cases? Do people know, um, you know, that this survivor is LGBTQIA? Kind of navigating um, that situation. All right, so safety with protective orders. So protective orders are a wonderful tool that can definitely increase safety. However, one of the issues with protective orders is that sometimes protective orders are kind of difficult to get, right? And it depends on your county too. So for example, I live in Weber County. So in Weber County, the judges are looking for different things um, in relation to protective orders. However, if we go to Salt Lake County, the judges might be looking for something a little bit different, right? Or to be um, presented in a different way. So survivors can absolutely fill out protective orders um, forms themselves and submit them and kind of um, try and navigate the system that way. Um, however, it's greatly beneficial for survivors to be able to access either a system advocate or a community-based advocate. The nice thing about system advocates is that they work with directly with police stations and with you know the county offices and stuff like that. So they have a, a, a wealth of knowledge on that criminal justice system and they um, will have a, a great ability to help with those protective orders. Um, similar to um, community-based advocates. Um, community-based advocates may not specifically be in a police station or a county building. However, um, they generally have um, a pretty good understanding of the protective order system within their county, right? So um, unfortunately, there are several states that do have um, hetero-specific domestic violence definitions. Um, and so that can be really difficult to getting protections or to seeking uh, to seek services and to seek help. Um, Utah, it, we're, we're, we kind of, we, we benefit a lot from having um, a vague and a broad, or a broad definition of um, intimate partner violence and domestic violence in the state of Utah, um, because that includes a lot of different folks, right? So in, um, you know, we do have, that we are we are we are lucky in that. Um, however, when working with survivors, um, 
especially if they have you know protective orders from other places or they're coming from other places it um, may be valuable to know how their state defines domestic violence how their state um, does protective orders and restrict restraining orders things like that um, because that may not translate um, from state to state and that would be good information to know um, unfortunately you know court systems you know, do lack some cultural competency on LGBTQIA folks. Um, they unfortunately may rely on myths to determine if the case um, is, you know, legitimate or if there's been actual harm. Um, so I have worked on several cases like this. Um, we had one, you know, where there was, you know, a gay couple, um, you know, the judge didn't understand um, the difference, you know, between unfortunately like consent and that like, you know, things like object rape or um, like rough anal sex, things like that, um, that they were not a, a normal part of a relationship, um, a queer relationship. And unfortunately, I've seen protective orders be denied because of that. Uh, I, I've seen survivors um, not able to get protective orders. I've seen, um, you know, folks who have perpetrated, um, you know, get protective orders against survivors. And so, you know, part of that is really educating folks is not only offering that that training, but also offering that support, right? Um, let's see. Okay, so safety on the job and in public. So this one, this one can be difficult. So we've talked a lot about safety within the home, safety um, during, you know, a violent incident and, and things surrounding where folks, folks live, right? Um, you know, places that folks know pretty well, right? And then we have the public space, right? Public public spaces um, can be difficult to navigate because we 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 never really know um, who's going to be there. We never really know um, what can possibly happen, right? Um, and at work, work can be complicated. What if um, the survivor and that person with abusive behavior share the same work, right? Share the the same workspace. Um, or the same school, right? So, are the folks at work affirming, right? Do they work for, not only do they work for a company or an organization that is LGBTQIA inclusive, right? Um, but are folks that work with them or for folks that surround them, are they affirming, right? Um, do they work together with, you know, other folks from marginalized identities? Do they do they have a a a support group, a support system at work, right? Um, and does the organization investigate instances of harassment? Do they do they stand by their policies? Do they stand by their words? Do they actually practice what they preach, right? Um, is there a non-disclosure act or a non-disclosure agreement, um, or no, excuse me, um, that's not, not a non-disclosure one. Uh, I, that one's escaping me for a sec, I'll come back to that. Um, so shared spaces. Um, does a survivor work directly with the person with that abusive behavior? Um, is the survivor or that person with abusive behavior, a supervisor, right? So think about being a survivor, right? Um, and your supervisor not only is maybe your partner, but also that, that person who has been perpetrating that, that violence against you. Um, how difficult will it be to navigate that situation at work, right? Um, what if you're not out at work? Uh, you know, how do you navigate that? Um, is this person, making it difficult for work for you at work are they making you do additional tasks are you being reprimanded at work for things that you're not doing or things that you do at home right so is that that domestic violence is that domestic abuse is it being 
is it is it is it bleeding over into the workspace right say you um you both go to the same college right you may not have the same you know seeking the same degree and have the same major however everyone has to take generals right and oftentimes people take the same generals they have basic classes right so they may be in the same you know psych 101 class together or um, they may be in the same building for certain classes right um, so how are we able to navigate those spaces um, do we get a dating violence protective order um, do we speak with teachers do we speak with professors do we speak with dean of the college or of the university what what do we do right um, women's centers are usually great places to go for um, domestic violence and sexual assault services um, but that can greatly um, leave men um, behind right or transgender folks or, or, or queer um, folks they may not feel like they can go in there they may not feel like they qualify um, to go in there for help or for services um, does the LGBTQ resource center um, do they have cultural competency on domestic violence and sexual assault within the LGBTQ community right so where are the places that they can go and are they culturally competent? Are they going to be able to get those services that they need? Um, back to the NDA, the Non-Discrimination um, Act. Excuse me <laughs> for that. So non-discrimination. So Utah has a Non-Discrimination Act, right? And so what that means is it protects sexual orientation and gender identity um, from like losing your job. So from employment discrimination and housing discrimination, right? So does that employer, is does the, the survivor live in a state that allows that, right? Um, does the employer also have a non-discrimination agreement? Does the, the employer also follow that, right? Do they not only have it in policy, but do they have it in practice, right? So generally, that the culture is created by these casual interactions, not dusty policies on a shelf, right? So are they practicing what they preach? Um, we kind of talked a little bit about this. Um, is the survivor out, right? Um, not only at work, um, but is that relationship um, out as well? Um, think about that um, in college settings, right? Um, does the college or the university itself have a non-discrimination um, policy or an anti-discrimination policy, right? And what does that look like? What are the steps to um, reporting or what are the steps to um, seek protection um, from that? Is it safe at work? So what does a survivor do for work? What does the, the person with abusive behavior do for work? So for example, me, I work largely on my own. Um, I travel around the state on my own. I work in my office. I do have an office mate, uh, but generally the majority of my work is done on my own. So if I had a partner you know, with abusive behavior and they were showing up, what if no one else was in the office? Or what if they, followed me to a training site. Not only does that increase my danger, but what about the other folks? Um, you know, the people that I'm training, the organizations that I'm going to. Um, you know, think about what if uh, the person works at Costco, right? Um, and that person, that, that partner with abusive behavior is, you know, maybe hanging around at their work. Um, Costco is a really big place and there's so many people that go through there. Um, this person may not be noticed, right? They may be able to, to hang out and watch that person. Um, what if someone's a construction worker, right? Um, well, that person with abusive behavior, is, is it going to be easier to access that person at work, right? Um, things like that. So really make sure that you're breaking this down 
right? That it's it's not just a, a, a one one answer fits all, right? Is that we really have to to stop and look at this person's unique situation and say, hey, what can we do to increase your safety at your work? What can we do to increase your safety while you go to school, right? All right, so safety and emotional health. Um, this is its own section, right? And this is this is a really big, really important section. So does the survivor have a community? Do they have a sense of community? Do they have support from a community, right? Um, this can be an, you know, an LGBTQ resource center, either on campus or maybe like a community-based center. Um, do they attend support groups, um, maybe social events um, at the center? Or, you know, what other, like maybe they have a community within the hobbies that they do. Um, for example, do they play Dungeons and Dragons, right? Um, are they able to connect with the local Dungeons and Dragons or, you know, tabletop role-playing game community? Are they able to go to a local game store, a local board game store? Um, do they have friends there? Um, you know, are, are there people that they hang out with and that um, they practice self-care with, right? Are they able to pursue those hobbies? Right. So think about being in a domestic or sexual violence situation, right, that the first thing that probably goes when you're stressed, when when, you know, you don't know what's going to happen when you're 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 worried, you're maybe freaking out. Is probably that self-care. Right. Think about when we're stressed at our work. What's the first thing that goes that that morning walk? right? Or the, the the two hours that we spend at the gym every day, right? Or maybe we stop reading our favorite book, right? That's generally the first thing that goes because it seems, it seems like it's, it's the most unneeded, like, oh, this is extra. But in reality, that self-care is one of the most important things that a survivor can do for themselves, is that an advocate can do for themselves, right? So finding that support is greatly important, right? One of the issues with community support and um, like LGBTQI centers, you know, social centers and stuff like that, is that if we have, you know, someone in a relationship in an LGBTQIA relationship, that that partner with abusive behavior may also go to that community center. So what do we do? We have two folks that are going to the Pride Center, right? We have one who is exerting power and control over the other person, and we have one person who's trying to increase their safety and get away from that, that power and control, right? What do we do? There's, there's very few community centers, there's very few places, um, you know, within Utah that have, um, you know, specific community um, centers like this, right? And what if someone is in a rural community, right? We do, we are starting to see more pride events, right? But those are happening like once a year, right? So, so, so what, what else can we do? What can we do? And this is when safety planning becomes safer planning, right? Because unfortunately, oftentimes we can't plan for, for safety. We can only try and increase that safety, right? So this is when we have the conversation um, and we plan with that survivor. So it sounds like there's, you know, a chance that you might run into or you might see, um, you know, your partner. So what can we do to go through that situation? What can we do to increase the safety? And what can we do to, to help you through that, right? Um, it can be, you know, as little as talking with the partner and, you know, reassuring them that you, you can leave that conversation, that you are under no obligation to interact with that person, right? Um, having conversations with staff at the community center, right? So talking with maybe um, the support group facilitator and saying, hey, this is the situation I'm in. Um, you know, I've been, you know, working with so-and-so and so, and I'm kind of worried that this and this will will happen. Um, what can we do to 
increase safety? What can we do to create a safe space, right? Um, and so those conversations can be difficult, right? Um, think about, you know, think about the last time maybe you felt fear or you felt uncomfortable or, or not safe, right? It's probably the first thing you wanted to do was leave, right? And what happens, um, you know, if that person leaves or that person avoids that community center is that they're increasing their isolation, right? And what happens when we increase isolation? We feel like we're alone. We feel like we don't have support and it makes it harder for us to maybe get out of that situation, right? It makes it harder for us to connect um, with those support systems. So this can be difficult. Um, there are, um, there is a LGBTQ specific um, affirming therapist guild in Utah, which is great. They have a website that you can look at all of the providers within Utah that um, have experience for their education in serving specifically LGBTQIA clients, which is wonderful, right? Um, we, we probably wanna send um, a, a transgender person to a therapist or to a support system that has had some experience with trans people and has some cultural competency, right? So that can be a great resource. And I can get those uh, resources out to you. All right, so, so safety during drug or alcohol use. So one of the big myths is that this is normal, right? And that alcohol and drug use is a normal part of an LGBTQIA relationship. This is a huge myth. This is greatly false, right? So alcohol and drug use are not a normal part of an LGBTQIA relationship, right? And it's a common myth. It's a myth that is is perfect is um is portrayed in the TV shows that we watch and and even like common and you know like our, our regular conversations with folks. Um, I really want you to be aware and I really want you to notice how LGBTQIA folks are um, seen, how they're portrayed um, through media and through entertainment, right? Um, so when a survivor does use substance, right, or they, they do have a dependency on the substance, um, this is where we, we definitely need to, to make sure our trauma-informed glasses are on, right? Um, that trauma-informed care, trauma-informed advocacy, um, you know, sees substance use, sees behaviors as strategies as ways to cope, right? So think about being in a, in a, a domestic violence relationship. Um, you, being able to numb out or to not have to be in that situation, um, even for a brief period of time, could be greatly beneficial, absolutely, right? Um, we don't want to, to be in a situation where we feel stuck. We don't wanna be in a situation where we feel pain. We don't want to be in a situation where we can't be, right? So absolutely a coping strategy, right? And you know, seeing seeing substance use as a symptom of the trauma, right? Not not the, the underlying issue. It's a symptom of something else, right? Also, substance use by a survivor is a barrier to service. There's um you know, there, there are organizations, there are service providers, places, you know, that folks can go and seek services. However, using substances or having substances in their system um, can stop them from being able to access that service, which is unfortunate, right? Um, because oftentimes that's used as a coping strategy for the, the abuse in the situation that they're in right now. And so we need to make sure that we're aware of that, right? And that, hey, if someone does come in and they, they do drink or if someone does come in and they do smoke marijuana, 
that we're, we're, we're looking at it like, okay, so this may be a strategy. This may be a way that they are coping with their situation. Not, oh, that person is a dirty pothead or gosh, why do I always get the alcoholics, right? So we need to remember that the people in front of us are in fact people. And sometimes, you know, through the myths, sometimes through the things that we hear on the media, the things that we have been socialized with, that we see them as not human. We see them as other. And that's where, where a big issue um, that we see when working with LGBTQIA folks. So safety during drug and alcohol use. So what if that partner with abusive behavior is using? How do we keep ourselves safe, right? So what if they do use alcohol? Right. Um, what if they, you know, maybe they drink excessively at night um, when they come home for work or maybe they binge drink sometimes. Right. So we don't know when that behavior um, or that that escalation might happen. Um, the survivor is an expert in their situation. Right. The survivor will probably know the tells or the warning signs of, hey, I think something's happening or, hey, I think, you know, something's gonna escalate or, you know, this when when they drink or when they, they get out a certain box, you know, that they, they may know um, when the escalation might happen. So it's really important to ask them and to get their input and say, hey, has your partner used, you know, alcohol or drugs with you, um, you know, during a violent incident, stuff like that, and kind of getting um, their feedback. And I just got a question. Um, okay, so this question. Okay, so this question um, says, this might be an unnecessary question, but I'm curious. I've noticed you have used partner with abusive behavior instead of abuser. Is this intentional? Um, if so, what has motivated you to use that language? Okay, that is an excellent, excellent question. Okay, so the reason why I use partner with abusive behavior or um, a, a person who has perpetrated um, or someone who has offended is when we say an a, abuser, right? That you are a or an abuser, you become the abuser. You be this becomes your your dominant identity, right? Um, that it's it's not your behavior that's an issue. It's not um, maybe the way that you're thinking or your your cognitive functioning that's an issue. It's you as a person. Right. And so when we say someone is an abuser, um, what we're we're basically doing is we're locking them into that abusive, that abuser identity. Right. And we know that abuse is learned is a learned behavior and we know that it can be unlearned. Right. So think about think about um, folks who maybe go to prison. Right. What, um, you know, sometimes folks will say, oh, um, you know, oh, they're a felon or oh you're a criminal, right? What happens when you become a criminal? What happens when you become a felon? It's, it's really hard to not be a criminal. It's really hard to not be a felon, right? Um, so so think, of, think of that, is that we're still working with humans. We're still working with folks who, who are struggling with something, right? And that can be really, really hard to, you know, see um, folks who have perpetrated or folks who have, you know, have had, you know, some abusive behavior, it's really hard to see them as, as human, right? Um, think about these, this good, bad dichotomy that we have within our culture, the idea that, um, you know, you're either good or you're bad, right? And that some folks are inherently good and they can do things to become bad. So, you know, like crime and, you know, things like that, right? Um, so it's really, really interesting. Um, and it's, it's, it's this really interesting dichotomy, right? Um, think about, think about how um, survivors when they, um, when, you know, maybe when they talk about a partner who has, um, you know, been abusive or is, you know, abusive. Um, 
that they, they, they kind of, they kind of like separate that person from that behavior, right? Um, think about, well, you know, they're, they're a good person. I don't know why they're doing that, right? And so this kind of plays into that, right? Is that good people don't do bad things, right? Um, so, so kind of kind of think about that, um, even within your language, right? Um, that you're using every day. Are we demonizing folks? Are we, are we, or are we holding them accountable, right? So there's a difference between holding people accountable and like demonizing them and um, pushing them away from um, services. Yeah, I hope that I hope that answered the question out there. <laughs> okay. So safety when leaving. So we talked about during a violent incident and we talked about when preparing to leave, right? So this is safety um, when leaving. So we know that this is the most dangerous time for a survivor, right? This is when they're most likely to be murdered by that partner. So shared spaces, right? We talked about, does that partner with abusive behavior, do they go to the same community center, right? Do they go to the same support group? Do they go to the same therapist, right? That one can be tough, um, especially when you're in a, a, what is it, a community, me, like a rural community, and there may literally only be two therapists, and one of them is LGBTQ affirming. Right, so what do I do? My, my, you know, my partner is also seeing the same therapist. Um, I don't know if I can find another therapist. I don't have access to a car. Can I drive? Right. Um, and think about the community centers that we do have. Right. You know, there's there's a few of them. Um, can that survivor find support? Can that survivor find or have a sense of community somewhere else, right? Um, there is, there has been a trend in specific, like especially transgender folks that they are going to online sources to find that support. Um, so we can see that there's some benefits there, but also that can be greatly um, isolating, right? Is that our, our support, it may be our only support is online, right? And is through a screen. Um, so yeah, the shared support. So think about friends, you know, think about even like on TV shows or, or maybe you've experienced when, um, you know, you've had friends who are a couple and they've broken up, right? It's kind of this weird, position that puts a lot of the friends, you know, in it's like, oh, no, can we be friends with both of them? Do we have to pick a side? Right. So think about when there is abuse present, think about how that can intensify those feelings. Right. And what if your friend, your friend group or your support system doesn't know that there was abuse present in that relationship? Right. So this can be this can be difficult. Um, think of as a survivor, you you know, have a friend group and then you, you know, you break up, um, you know, with your partner with abusive behavior. Um, but I just got another question. I was checking it. Okay. Um, <laughs> you know, you break up with that partner um, and then your friends, you know, half of your friends, you know, go with in our friends with them and don't really talk to you anymore. How would that feel? You know, that it may feel like, oh, my friends are literally siding with, with someone, um, you know, that has, uh, has abused, has, has perpetrated this abuse before. Um, how that can feel for, for a survivor. And that, that could, that could, you know, really stop them from seeking support in the future or m making it difficult for them to find friends or to, to have more intimate relationships. Let's see, there we go, okay. I was like, my computer was being a little slow for a sec there. All right, so 
I want to hear from y'all. So what do you feel is the biggest barrier to safety planning? So I'm going to pull up this poll. It should, there you go, should pop up on your screen. So what do you feel is the biggest barrier to safety planning? Yeah, this one could be a difficult difficult one, right? Because there's there's a lot of options out there. So what do you think? What do you feel is the biggest barrier to safety planning? And remember, knowing this information and being able to identify it greatly helps us to overcome it, right? When we know, hey, there's a problem, we can identify it and then we can find ways and strategies on how to fix it, right? So I have a couple people voted so far. Oop, shut up a bunch. About a third of you have voted. So what do you feel is the biggest barrier to safety planning? Got about half folks that have voted. Get a couple more folks to vote. Got about 75% of folks are in. All right. Okay, let's get this shared for y'all. All right, so. Well, we, we had quite the spread. So we had quite the spread. So homophobia or fear, right? Lack of knowledge was 17%. And then we had lack of LGBTQ cultural competency by, and unfortunately it cuts off for me. So I'm going to try and pull this up outside to get it. We had 17% on that. And then on the third option, we had 33% on that. Well, let's see. All right. So the second one was lack of cultural competency by service providers. So folks, advocates, um, organizations sorry for that little hiccup there so the th the the third one was lack of cultural competency by law enforcement or legal right um the fourth one was at 17 percent, so no resources available that are culturally competent mm -hmm. and then the fifth option was unknown or other so yeah we have a pretty big spread there right it's it's really hard to kind of kind of determine it right and the interesting thing is, um, like these ideas of like homophobia, transphobia, cisnormativity, and heteronormativity um, are, are based in like gender roles, right? Are based in the way that we have been socialized to do gender and to experience gender. So those could be like maybe a backbone of it, right? But how does it, how does it, um, what does it look like, right? Um, and that can be in so many different ways. Oh, that was a wonderful. Thank you all for um, participating in that poll. Those were some, that was good. So, a little bit of a review here. Um, so, when you're advocating for LGBTQ LGBTQIA survivors, um, there's a lot of things to keep in mind, right? Um, a lot of the stuff we've talked about today, um, some of the stuff that maybe we didn't, um, we may have missed today. Um, and if you do have any questions, make sure to email me. Um, you can also text me, um, leave a message at my office, and we can get that information for you. So the possibility of outing, right? So that's a really big one. Um, you know, the idea that someone with you know an lgbtqia identity is somehow less than or somehow 
um, have not the norm really adds to that 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 stereotyping really adds to that stigma and really adds to that discrimination, right? The idea that that LGBTQIA, that, that queer and trans folks, that that we have to come out, right? Is a huge issue that we can't just be, right? That we have to come out. The lack of community support um, and that could be lack of actual community um, organizations that are available, actually having um, access to support, right? So think about um, having access, say we have community services, right? What if you're an undocumented transgender person? Are you gonna be safe there, right? Are you safe? as an undocumented trans person to walk into a police station and ask for a protective order, right? Are you are you safe going to social groups or, or community social events, right? Um, think about the way how accessibility is defined within our organizations, right? Um, do we have even like wheelchair accessibility, right? So we may have a, a building that we can get to, but can we get inside the building, right? Can we actually access those services? Um, our, uh, another uh, thing that we need to look out for is, say we do have a community um, organization, are they not only culturally competent, you know, to LGBTQ folks, um, but what about that intersectionality, right? What about those other marginalized identities and their intersections with the sexual and uh, gender identity, right? Um, do we have services for non-native English speakers? Do we have services for undocumented folks? Um, what about, you know, we may have like support groups, um, you know, for transgender folks. Um, do we have, um, you know, legal services for a gender change? Do we have brochures, information, um, even referrals for folks that do, right? So remember, it's it's not enough just to have a rainbow flag, you know, on like a door, um, but actually putting that into, into practice. Um, remember losing job and housing is a big thing. So even though Utah has a non-discrimination act um, enacted, that there's still loopholes. So um, private renters, um, you know, folks that have, um, I'll have to get you the number, uh, a small, a limited amount of units, they fall under that loophole, right? Um, and also, like organizations with like um, less than 15 employees, right? So, so think about, think about that, right? How many, how many of us live um, within that loophole? Um, interesting enough is I live and work within that loophole, right? So UDVC is, uh, we only have nine employees, right? So I fall within that loophole, right? Um, I love that I, you know, work for an organization that 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 greatly supports and acts on inclusion and breaks down that discrimination. But a lot of folks aren't as lucky as me, right? A lot of folks are not don't have that privilege um, that I do. So the last one, police may not be culturally competent, right? So we are seeing an increase in training. Um, for police agencies, which is wonderful, right? Um, however, there are still um, some some lacking within that training, right? And we do need to remember that it isn't really appropriate to walk into a police station and say, hey, you're not doing this right, you need to do this, right? Because that's not really going to go very far. We need to meet people where they are, right? And we also need to speak that language. Right. So we need to help bridge that gap um, with understanding. Right. So here's some resources 
Um, so in Utah, we have 15 domestic violence service providers. They're um, available 24 seven, um, a number of different services, uh, you know, emergency shelter, oftentimes folks think of domestic violence service or uh, like a domestic violence shelter um, that, oh, well, you know, I can stay there if I need to leave a, a situation, right? But oftentimes emergency shelter is not necessarily what a survivor needs, right? It could be other things like, hey, I need help um, getting a car or I need help um, getting a driver's license, right? Or a protective order. Um, the majority of domestic violence service providers in Utah are dual providers. So they have um, sexual assault programs, right? Um, it's really important to remember that domestic and sexual assault aren't separate, right? Um, they can be, right? However, much of the time, the domestic violence and the sexual assault are overlapping, right? That if it's happening in the kitchen, it's probably happening in the bedroom. Um, case management, counseling, support groups. Um, there are a number of places that offer rape crisis responses, right? Um, so UDVC has a bunch of these resources online. We are currently moving over our website. Um, so we'll have a new website hopefully rolled out soon. Um, and then you'll start to see more things being posted on there. Okay. Domestic violence, um, the National Domestic Violence Hotline. We use some of their information today um, in this presentation. Wonderful, wonderful resource. Um, if anything, go online, kind of look at the things that they have um, to, to see what, what, what good of a resource this can be for you. You know, Write down this number, um, let folks know, hey, 24 seven, you can call this and you don't have to speak English to call this. Right, so they have um, more than 200 languages available. So the Utah Domestic Violence Link Line. So this is Utah's 24 hour um, domestic violence crisis line. Right? So they can do a number of things that advocates can do. Um, however, um, they're, they're, not a, they're not a counseling service, so um, we can't meet directly with individuals, so that's kind of um, where there'll be a little bit of a cutoff. Um, however, a big part of the, the link line is offering resources, right? So as a service provider, as a friend, as even a survivor, um, or just a community member that wants to know more, call 24 seven, right? Let that, that person have a nice conversation at three in the morning, right? Get through your questions answered, the support is there for you. Um, we are available 24 seven. Um, oh, here's my information. Um, you're welcome to reach out to me. Um, I will be able to get the PDF of this sent out to you hopefully um, this week. Um, this is my direct office line, the 801-521-5544, extension 106. Also, you can um, press the option for training um, on the, the phone menu when it pops up. But my email address, really quick way to get a hold of me, um, and I'll be able to send you resources that way as well. And it looks like I have a question here. Okay, no, I didn't have a question, but cool. If anyone else has any questions, go ahead and put it in that question box. I'm so glad to see y'all utilizing that. Um, it's been really beneficial this time around. <laughs> if there are any last questions, we'll get those answered before we let you on your way. <laughs> and our next webinar will be actually next week. Okay, so our next webinar is going to be next Tuesday at the same time um, on the 17th of July. And I am going to be covering male survivors of domestic and sexual violence. So this one is entitled Humanizing, Advocating, and Supporting Male Survivors. Um, so if you haven't registered for that one, definitely get on there and register for that. Um, 
there's going to be a lot of great information on working with male survivors, and it's really going to bridge a lot of those, those myths and those gaps in our knowledge um, when working with male survivors. So going from you know, thinking of, of male survivors as perpetrators, you know, like, oh, you're trying to infiltrate, to you are a survivor, you are someone who has experienced trauma, and how am I going to advocate for you, right? And so kind of breaking down a lot of those myths and giving you a lot of that information um, that y'all desperately um, have needed, so. All right, well, it looks like we don't have any other questions. So thank you very much for hopping on this webinar and hopefully I'll see you again um, soon. Have a wonderful day and you will be here, you will be hearing from me <laughs> shortly. Thank you, friends.